Okay, Tigers, welcome aboard. Uh, here we are with the Friday uh, video lecture. Um, and uh, we're going to talk about cheating culture. Hang on just a second while I bring up my PowerPoint. Um, there it is. Look at that. Uh, and we'll start the slideshow from right here. Okay, and I'm going to do a quick stick my head around and make sure that the stupid thing works. Yes, it looks like it works. Yay, okay. Okay, um, by now you guys have um, read fairly extensively into the Cheating Culture book. And um, so, uh, you know, on, on um, those of you who are here, the select few of you who were... Um, <laughs> <laughs> who made it to class on Wednesday um, and got the um, the discussion of the Washington Post and Janet Cook will have recognized Bradley's Washington Post as a cheating culture. Now we're going to riff on that just a little bit today. Um, and uh, I do want to make one connection, which is going to sound really blindly obvious, but it isn't necessarily. Um, all cheat, all just deceptive media represent cheating in the sense of a cheating culture, right? Um, so the definition of cheating, right, is getting something, trying to get something that you're not entitled to, a dollar, a byline, a promotion, a grade, whatever. There are people that don't mind cheating at all. Um, bad pop psych books like this one, which is really quite a terrible book, um, call them sociopaths. And I'm not sure they are really, but they are kind of dangerous, um, if nothing else, because they're so hard to read. But most people aren't like that. Most of us think of ourselves as morally solid folks, right? Good, good examples to our offspring and our younger relatives, faithful friends to our faithful friends. A really great way to get punched is to start calling people thieves and liars, even if you've just caught them stealing or lying in the past 10 or 15 minutes, right? Yet they do it. We're constantly seeing good people cheating, or at least people who consider themselves good. But if they are good, you wouldn't know it to watch the news, right? When a, when a quote unquote good person doesn't get busted doing bad things, they still get to think of themselves as good. And a confession years later lets everybody feel better about everything. But when a good person, or quote-unquote good person, does get busted, he or she has a label forced on, and years later that person is still being defined by that early incident as a thief, or a liar, or a druggie, or whatever. Look at Stephen Glass, not able to get licensed by the California Board of Attorneys because they're like, well, you're a, um, a lying journalist. Well, you know, I kind of was one in 1998, but come on, people. Um, look at um, um, Janet Cook, one of the most talented journalistic writers this country has ever produced. And I have heard nothing from her since she left that paper. She has not been given a second chance. People don't get second chances at those high levels. Um, but it's kind of interesting because when somebody does get busted doing something big, we usually get told someone at least wants to tell us that they are outliers, that they're special, a few bad apples. Okay, like Lon John Ashcroft talking about Martha Stewart, or, you know, that's, that's, that's going way back. That was the telecom scandal, right? Basically, Martha Stewart, this is Mad Magazine put out a guide to Martha Stewart's prison tattoos, which was kind of weird, and on this screen, it may actually look like she's naked. She's not. She's actually wearing a beige outfit, which looks basically the same color as her. So, um, anyway... Um, yeah, uh, that, that was in like 2002, though, so I should probably come up with a, a better analogy from more recently. Brent, ben Bradley talking about Janet Cook, right? She's just a pathological liar. There's nothing we could do. All we could do is just watch out for pathological liars. Let's unpack Bradley's <laughs> comments just a little bit. I used to have a link here to um, a video of him actually saying these things, but... Um, it, it went dead. Um, it was taken down after he died. Um, basically, he said that there's nothing, not a thing wrong with the system in which Janet Cook cheated. It's Janet Cook who is broken or defective. He referred to her, as I said, as a pathological liar, and that may have been true. But um, other than, for God's sake, check it out when somebody who might be a pathological liar says something, he had very little to say about the system in the Post's newsroom. 
The implication was there's nothing wrong with how we do business. We just need more enforcement or tougher punishment or higher quality scotch or, you know, whatever. The solution, in other words, is to beef up security to keep the bad apples out. And that argument is always bullshit. In fact, anytime you hear the phrase bad apples, you're in 95% bullshit territory. I mean, here's what bad apples really means. I'm going to have to read this to you because I don't know if you can read this screen. Our system inspires and rewards people for cheating. That benefits us at the top because we get the benefits of their increased productivity, so we would like the situation to continue. In order for that to happen, we are now distracting attention from our corrupt system by throwing the person who screwed up under the bus. This is particularly satisfying because we're all really pissed off at that person for having almost blown our cover by being stupid. So that's what they deserve, not for cheating, but for being stupid and almost ruining it for everybody. Uh, I'm not sure Ben Bradley thought of it quite in those terms. In fact, I'm quite sure he did not. But if we could get him to be perfectly honest, I think he'd probably have to admit that it's at least partly accurate. Would he have been happier if no one ever figured out that Jimmy was a work of fiction so that he could deny everything with a clear conscience? So the Post could have gone on thinking it was doing important work, telling important stories, making D.C. residents care? Of course he would. He wouldn't go back to ignorance if he had the chance, but he was happier when he was ignorant. And he's probably at least a little bit annoyed with Janet for being so stupid to break him out of that lovely world. Now, so there has to have been some nagging feeling in his head. Why did you have to go and be so stupid, Janet? <laughs> a hallmark of this class is that we go full Godwin at every opportunity. And the time for that is now. When Hitler was running Western Europe, hundreds of thousands of ordinary Germans participated in Nazi atrocities, including these average Joes in SS uniforms strolling past a burning building in Warsaw Ghetto. There were probably at least five or six, maybe five or six dozen civilian casualties within the building that they're walking past. Um, were these guys all bad apples? Every single one of them? Nope they operated in a system that was specially designed to make ordinary people into cold-eyed monsters. Now, were they responsible for what they did? Absolutely, they were responsible. You're responsible for what you do, even when you are in a system like that. But if Himmler had stepped up and claimed that the Nazi government was totally fine, the Holocaust was the, bunch of, the fault of a bunch of bad apples, and that all he was responsible for was lax oversight, <laughs> no sale, right? Ridiculous, right? It's an extreme example, but it illustrates a point. Bad apples are made, not born. The Nazi system <laughs> was a system designed to make them by in wholesale lots, you know, including these guys who were just regular German dudes. Um, and here they are perpetrating one of history's great war crimes, or great is probably a bad, one of the history's largest scale war crimes since the frickin' um, um, Mongol conqueror, conquest. They're, bad apples are not born. They're made, I mean, you're not, are not made. Ugh, bad apples are made. They're not born. They're, they're made by systems that select for them and reward their badness, and they are made by systems that bring that badness out and justify it and give it permission. They're made by cheating cultures. Here's a slightly less ridiculous slash hitler -y example. Um, it's also an example that everybody can relate to. It's speeding. The law says you can go 65.000 miles an hour in all the freeways around here. If you're from Eastern Oregon, you're laughing and thinking how much it sucks to be us because you can go 70. Well, whatever. Um, oh wait, no, I guess you can't. You can just go 65. It's 70. If you're from Washington, I mean. Anyway, um, but who actually does that, right? The perilously elderly, the dangerously impaired, people with warrants out for their arrest, people who are already being followed by a cop. And that's it, right? Um, oh, and by the way, this, this cartoon, it's, it's hard to see. It's one of those cartoons from one of the, um, like, stag mags from the 70s and um the guy in the little sports car is saying to the cop i was speeding to get home before the drinks could kick in uh so yeah um right so the freeway traffic rockets along at 80 miles an hour 
and say you're pulling a trailer, so you're supposed to be going 55, but the cars are rocketing past you doing 25, 35 miles an hour more than you, and people are giving you personal fingernail inspections. I always kind of had this idea that, that someday I was going to, like, get myself a, a bottle of, of industrial day glow orange nail polish and just do this one fingernail um, for traffic signaling purposes, of course. But anyway, um, right? So you, the obeyer of traffic laws, are a genuine hazard on the road because the cheaters have defined the highway culture and the expectations of performance are predicated on cheating. So let's say you goose it up to 70, you know, temptation, you yield a little bit and you, you get in, and you know how this story ends, right? Everybody sees him, but you, it's Cartman right up there ahead. And the only driver who doesn't see him in time to slow down is you. So the cop pulls out and pulls you over and writes you a $250 ticket because you are a bad apple, aren't you? There's nothing wrong with a system of speed limits and law enforcement. It just it just needs to use more force on reluctant, defiant scoff laws like you. You should be ashamed of yourself. In fact, you probably are, even though I'm being sarcastic here, but ashamed and humiliated and most of all furious because you know it's not right, especially when you see another car whizzing by doing 85 now because the driver can see the cop is busy writing you a ticket. The freeway is a classic cheating culture. Everybody on the road has to cheat just to get to work safely. And every now and then a cop harvests a random driver to make an example of. And we tolerate it because our odds are, are so low that our number will come up. And we benefit from the cheating, sort of. But here's the real casualty of, of cheating culture on the freeway. How much moral authority do speed limit laws have for you? Probably not much. If you knew with 100% certainty that no cops would catch you, would you obey the speed limit anyway? Very unlikely. Very unlikely. I wouldn't. <laughs> and I consider myself pretty, pretty boring in that whole law and order sort of, sort of category. Yet it's the law, right? In name only though, right? In practice, the law is don't get caught. In other words, keep it to 74.9 miles an hour and you'll be all right. Um, the speeding law's legitimacy is utterly bankrupt. Nobody thinks of speeding as breaking the law. Everybody knows it is breaking the law. Rock-solid law and order types who would never dream of shoplifting a muffin or, or selling white dope at the middle school, they break the speed law any, every day, the speed limit every day. This was one of the biggest lessons of prohibition, um, as in alcohol prohibition, not marijuana prohibition, but maybe that too. It bred contempt for the law. Perception was that the government was overreaching, right? I'll drink if I want to. Piss off, G-man. The government was increasingly heavy-handed in its enforcement. This was perceived as simple thuggishness. People broke the law to demonstrate their contempt for it and the Snoopy politicians and who wouldn't mind their own businesses. Prohibition spawned cheating cultures in every big city and in most of Eastern Oregon too, because of course, that was one of the really great ways that you can make a ton of money on your, your rural back, you know, Oregon outback, um, um, you know, 500 acres or whatever was um, by, you know, running a still on it, shipping it into the city. So yeah. Um, if you owned a drugstore and didn't serve your customers, they went somewhere else. If you had a restaurant, ditto, you, you didn't want to cheat, fine. You just go out of business. When the official rules are not being enforced or when um, social pressure um, is, is so contrary to the official rules that they have no legitimacy, willingness to ignore those rules becomes a competitive advantage. The playing field is not level. Your code of ethics will cost you money. And Callahan points out another even bigger problem, and that is this, the benchmarks change. Your customers' expectations, or your bosses, or whoever you answer to, recalibrate based on what everybody else is doing. So you're a truck driver who drives 55 on the freeway, and all the other truck drivers do 65, and you'll log fewer miles than they do. And your boss will naturally benchmark on the cheaters and wonder what the hell's wrong with you, right, you lazy person. Here's an illustration from my life and probably yours as well, and that is overtime. Um, when I started out as a reporter in 1991, fresh out of college, I was basically told, here are the performance benchmarks. You should be able to be able, be able to, to get this number of stories done and this number of things done and help lay out the paper in 40 hours. Overtime is not allowed. Well, um, consistently, it was a 60 plus hour week. 
But if I failed to keep up, I knew I'd be fired and replaced. It never occurred to me that the expectations were out of line. I figured it was just taking me longer because I was new at it. So I just worked as long as it took to get the job done. At the end of the week, I claimed 40 hours. And I now know that Nikki Cribb, the reporter before me, had done the same thing. What else could she have done, right? The reporter before her produced that much work. If she held the line at 40 hours, she'd be canned and replaced with someone who would meet those expectations. The, the, the benchmarks for the job had been established by a cheater. And to meet those benchmarks, I had to become a cheater, too. Of course, I was cheating myself, but I was also helping cheat poor Carrie Dennett, the reporter who came in after me and had to do the same thing. This is almost standard procedure in the corporate world, at least in some parts of it right? It establishes, or enables rather, a substantial boost in the productivity of the, co of the, of the enterprise while insulating upper management from responsibility for how that boost is, is, is obtained. If you can get somebody to arrange a cheating culture for you to benefit from without ever becoming aware of it, you win big, right? Like Ben Bradley at the Washington Post, proud as punch of the magnificent Pulitzer Prize winning job that Janet Cook was doing, and then he learned the truth. But once that veil of, protective veil of protective ignorance is pierced, the party is over. Now, this dynamic can get dangerously close to the threshold of willful ignorance. And the fact is, our um, economic system as it stands today rewards willful ignorance big time. We learned this in the 2008 financial meltdown. There was a cheating culture for you. What happens if your investment bank refuses to trade in swindly mortgage derivatives? It makes 5% profits while the competitors make 20. Your investors get disgusted with the peanut scraps you're providing honestly, pull their cash out, and pump it into the cheaters' funds. You go bankrupt. They do eventually too, but they survive to get bailed out by the Fed. Which, you know, <laughs> only the good die young, I guess. Well, okay, what does all this have to do with bullshit detecting? Well, it is part of the all-important question. Who's talking? It creates patterns that you can look for when you're consuming media. When the Washington Post started the holy shit squad and started pressuring reporters to produce holy shit class work, they responded. This created tremendous pressure to produce holy shit and left very few controls in place to make sure that it worked. We know that pressure resulted in one cheater, Janet, but uh, uh, Janet was behaving very stupidly. And everyone seems to agree that there was an expectation at the post that would have been hard to meet, honestly. If Janet had been a little smarter about her cheating, would she ever have been caught? Isn't it a pretty good bet that the other reporters were maybe cheating a little bit too to get a great story? I mean, yeah. Anytime you see a sensational story from the Washington Post in the early 80s, it's good to keep that in mind. The Post was a product of a cheating culture. And Joanne Omeg's quote, where she said that there's so much pressure and the, the editors are like, oh man, that's not a story. Well, that's because you suck, right? It's your fault that this thing that you mentioned that I'm all excited about now isn't a page one story. You know, that's cheating culture pressure. That's get me a story and don't ask too many questions cult pressure. Um, when you see signs of a corporate culture in which there's real pressure to cheat, go on high alert because you can take this to the bank. Someone in that environment is responding to that culture. Um, there's a slight cheating culture element in all um, regularly scheduled... Um, um, what do you call them? Um, like, like 60 Minutes and stuff like that. Investigative journalism kind of things. Because um, in order to continue having a show, they have to have something to talk about each week. So they have to go out and find something to talk about each week. And if there isn't anything to talk about, they got to find something anyway. So usually there's, there's enough corruption and, and badness going on out there in the world to, to keep, them, keep them going, but it's something to always kind of keep in mind. That brings us to a triumphal conclusion of, oh, wait, no, 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 there is more. Now, this is going to be, I'm going to have to actually, I'm going to have to shift this over and present this to you on Monday. Um... Several years ago, a bad apple fallacy scam came along so egregious that it nearly brought down the whole deal. Um, and it was Wells Fargo Bank, which, um, in order to keep your job at Wells Fargo Bank, 
um, you basically had to slam people into accounts that they weren't, you know, you kind of like pressure people into opening new accounts and stuff like that. And some people responded to that pressure by literally opening accounts without people's permission. Uh, when he was called on the carpet about it, the CEO of um, <laughs> Wells Fargo said something along the lines of, well, we've got some bad apples that were doing bad things and... Yeah, we're, um, mm -hmm. yeah, we got them all fired, so it's all good. Um, Stephen Colbert unpacked it pretty, uh, pretty um, concisely, and I'm going to play that video for you, but I'm not going to do it here, because watching a video on a video, no. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to close off this, um, this video lecture and um, can up a second one. But there's going to be two, because this is only 20 minutes long, so you're going to have to watch two videos, I'm sorry. Two short ones instead of one long one. Um, okay.